And turning your King James Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to talk to you today about when God uses a Christian to destroy the wicked. I've seen this thing many, many times in my life. There's times that the Lord has put me into situations, and at the time I don't understand it. I think, why would you, you know, put me into this situation? And this situation failed, I thought, but later on I realized it was God put me there to judge wicked people. Um, the Lord, never forget, when you get born again, when God saves you, genuine, genuinely and truly saves you, you are His bondservant. You are a slave to Him. Okay, He puts His yoke upon your neck. Take my yoke upon you, the Bible talks about. And when Jesus Christ controls your life, it's up to Him to decide where He's going to send you and what He's going to do. You do have a free will, not some wacko Calvinist or whatever that says that God just preordains everything. You have a free will, okay? But God will put you into situations of His choosing. He purchased you with His blood, and He owns you, and He controls your life. If you're genuinely born again, if you're lost, well, then you go on and you just do all your wicked stuff, and nothing really changes. God doesn't direct your life. But if you're saved, He does. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to see this thing here of this power of that where God will actually use a Christian that uh, and put him into situations where he will actually use that Christian for destruction. Let me show you. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification, and not for your destruction, I shall I should not be ashamed, that I may seem that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters, for his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily speech, or his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, uh, my speech is pretty contemptible. If you've watched me for years and years, you know that I stumble all over myself, you know, a lot. And uh, uh, I don't edit things out. You don't see these little video clips, cuts and edits and whatever else. It's just as it is, you know, anybody that's met me in person or spoken to me on Skype or whatever else will tell you that, yeah, Brian's the same off video camera as he is, you know, in person. Uh, I don't, I don't uh, put on a special presence or use a special voice when I preach. But the key here is found there in verse 8. Paul has been given authority. And I believe it's not just an apostolic thing or whatever else, the sign gifts and whatever that were given to the apostles to convert the Jews. No, I think it's actually something that's given to every Christian. And that authority is, the Lord hath given us, notice he says us there, not just me. The Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction. You know, one of the most frustrating things for me has been over the years. It has been the fact that I have tried to edify people out there within professing Christianity, um, I've tried to edify people and they'll reject it because I've said it. They'll just make it about me. And they'll say, well, well Denlinger's for this or Denlinger's against that. So therefore I am going to reject what it's, what this, whatever thing is because Denlinger said so. Um, because I hate Brian Denlinger and I can't stand, I don't, I don't want to be a Denlinger, right? You know, whatever that is. And, um, so I'm just going to reject it. Uh, that's foolish. And what happens is I come out give you a good example and I say you need to get away from soda pop, whatever you want to call this stuff, you know, um, carbonated soft drinks, uh, high fructose corn syrup in a can, you know, whatever. You know why I'm doing that? Because I used to drink that stuff and I know how it adversely affected my health. And I'm trying to edify people, not just save brethren either, by the way. If you're lost, if you're an atheist, the most hardcore, God-hating, Bible-rejecting atheist, get away from soda pop. It's bad for you. Okay? Get away from pharmaceuticals. Get away from uh, all kinds of stuff. Video games and television and rock music. and This stuff's bad for you. I'm trying to edify people. And what happens? Well, Paul, he comes to the Corinthians and he's saying, hey, you've got to give up for, flee fornication and, and you need to get rid of this. You need to get rid of that. He's giving them a whole list of these commands. Stop doing this. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. He's trying to edify, you see. That's what he's trying to do. And they're rejecting it. And they're getting false prophets coming in there and saying, oh, you don't listen to Paul. Paul, he's just, you know, whatever. He's a troublemaker. He's legalistic, <laughs> you know, all this stuff. 
Just forget about all these standards that Paul's trying to preach. And Paul's saying, if you do those, if you do that, if you reject me trying to edify you, it's going to lead to your destruction. Hey, you know what? If you have cigarettes in your life, you need to get rid of them. You know why I said that? Um, because I'm trying to edify you. Oh, Denlinger, you're such an idiot. You're this, you're that. I'm just going to keep on smoking my cigarettes. Okay, it's going to lead to your destruction, you see. Hey, you need to get rid of your uh, new versions, your new Vatican versions. You know why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit in them. I've spent years and years and years going over these new versions. I have most of them, and uh, they're wicked. Oh, I reject King James onlyism. Okay, then go with your new versions that will lead you to hell. I mean, you can't teach real strong doctrine with these new versions. Even you know, like a lot of the scholars out there would have, you know, agree with that. There's so many problems with these new versions. They're constantly changing and changing and changing. It's terrible. That whole philosophy, and it is a philosophy, of the new version mindset leads to confusion. What's the final authority for somebody that uses multiple new versions? They are. Their pastor is. Their professor is. Whatever. So I come along trying to edify somebody and say, why don't you just use the King James Bible? Just use it. Oh, I reject it. Okay, it's your destruction. You see, that's what's going on here. And um, here's the point of this whole study. There are times that God puts you into that situation as a born-again you know, Bible believer. God will put you into situations like that to judge those wicked people. I mean, how many times have you ever talked to a uh, <clears throat> Christian and you start to bring up issues of truth and they get mad? I've seen it so many times, you know. I'll go with Christian, you know, visit a Christian relative, you know, or whatever else, and, and you start to talk about the truth, you know. The King James Bible is God's perfect word. The others aren't. And they'll get mad. Hey, you know that rock music? That stuff's wicked. Hey, you know that stuff over there? You shouldn't be doing that. I'm trying to edify, but it actually leads to their destruction because, you see, they reject the truth and they try to blame it on me. They try to say, well, that's just your beliefs. That's just your opinions. You know, uh, no truth is truth, regardless of who says it. And if you reject the truth, you can reject me all day long, whatever. You know, I don't like the way you look. I don't like the, the red and black buffalo plaid. I don't like your beard. I don't like your glasses, your hair, your ears are too pointy or whatever. Some stuff that's been leveled at me over the years. You can reject me. Cast out my name as evil. I don't care. But if you're rejecting the truth, it's going to lead to your destruction. That's the whole point. Turn over to chapter 13, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 5. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates? Oh, the devil's trying to get me to question my salvation. Well, right there, Paul's telling them to question their salvation. Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. I preach a lot on false conversion. You know why? Because I want true conversion. I want people to truly get saved. Okay, for a long time, I was a professing Christian, and I was just as lost as you could be. You know, I there was no broken, you know, brokenness in my life. I wasn't considering myself to be a bad person. I was a good person. I was raised in church, the whole thing. Got saved in Sunday school as a child, you know, the whole deal. I was a false convert. I had to get to a place where I examined myself and I realized, you know what? The reason I can't relate to this book is because I'm not born again. And I got saved. Praise the Lord for it. But you get somebody and they say, I'll just never examine myself. I just, I got saved. I did this and this and that. I, I, you know, I believe, I trusted, I, I you know, whatever. Um, did God save you? Where's the change? Where's the proof? All right? Examine yourself. Very simple. Verse 6, But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. You know, it's kind of funny. You get people that are, oh, I'm a Christian, but I hate uh, Denlinger's guts, or I hate this person, that person that's saved. Um, <laughs> there's a problem there. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil. Do no evil. Hmm. 
Not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. See, again, he's saying you should know that we're not reprobates, but hey, if you're going to call us reprobates, then there should be that changed life there. You're not to be doing evil things. You see? For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. He's coming. He's giving them truth. He's saying you need to turn from this stuff. You need to stop doing these wicked things. Why? Because he's trying to edify them. And they're rejecting that. They're rejecting the truth. And Paul's saying, you can call me a reprobate all you want, but don't you reject the truth. Because if you do, it's going to destroy you. It's going to destroy your life. Call Brian Denlinger a reprobate all you want. Don't become a Denlingerite, please. <laughs> you know, I, I can't stand the thing of people worshiping me, honestly and seriously. But just don't reject the truth. Reject me when I'm saying things that are wrong and fleshly and carnal and whatever else. But when I say truth, don't reject that. Verse 10, For we are glad when we are weak, and ye are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. How can you have perfection in the life of a Christian if there's no change? Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness, according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. There you see it again. God, when He saves you, when He purchases you with his blood he gives you a certain power the lowliest christian male female whatever you have a certain power now because you see you're god's property and he gives you the ministry of reconciliation and you're an ambassador for jesus christ and you go out there and you start to say to people even the most shy backward christian god will still use them i've seen it many many times and god will say hey i want you to be an example in front of these people why? To edify him. I mean, what is the gospel? Think about the gospel. Hey, you've messed up your life. We've all messed up our lives. Yeah, you can be saved. You can go to heaven when you die and have perfect health and live in a mansion and walk on streets of gold and all kinds of riches like you couldn't imagine and never cry again, never suffer. Hey, how about some edification? Your life is really poor and really bad. How about looking forward to heaven? Talk about edification. And what do people do? Well, it's just your opinion. Don't cram your religious beliefs down my throat. On and on and on. What are they doing? They're destroying themselves. You know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, comes down here, God manifests in the flesh, and He's walking around and He's still marveling at people's unbelief. You know, he knows. He understands. He created them. He's the creator of the world, and He's still just... <laughs> do you ever find yourself doing that? You say, I don't understand how these people can do that. And in your mind you go, I do understand because the Bible said so and I understand why they're doing it, but I just, I don't understand. <laughs> you just, sometimes it's so confusing. You want to help people and they just, no, you know. I mean, it's like somebody could be drowning in the, in the river and you throw them a life raft and they say, and they knock it away, get that thing out of my, you know. You're drowning. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to save you. Come on here, you know, let me help you. I don't need your help as they go under the water and drown. Absolutely incredible. Romans chapter 3. If you've been saved for any length of time, you know what I'm talking about. It's just, it's amazing. You get, you know, you're so naive. It's so, you're such a cute little Christian, you know, when you first get saved. Any of us, you know. <laughs> and you just think, this is great. I got saved. God saved me and my life is changing and I'm giving up all this stuff. And, I'm, and oh, it's so, it's so neat. You know, that first love, you know, you get there and, and you just want to tell people and you go and you say, guess what? And they say, what? I just got saved. You see, I was, I was going to church and I was false and everything else. And the more you talk, the more you see their countenance changing. And pretty soon they're shifting back and forth and you can just tell they're about ready to rip your head off and, and before long they are ripping your head off if you keep talking. And you think, I wanted to edify you. But instead it turns into their destruction. They're rejecting the truth that you're speaking. Romans chapter 3 verses 10 through 18. As it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. 
There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Oh, what a message of condemnation, hate speech. Oh, how judgmental. Um, why is the Lord writing this in his word? Because he's just saying, hey, everybody qualifies to be saved. You know, everybody's over here. Old things, rattlesnakes, lightning, cliffs, horrible, bad stuff. And you can be over here. All you got to do is just admit to the truth that you're here. Simple, you know. How about some edification? You're sick. You're poor. You qualify. Okay? You're a sinner. You qualify to be saved. Verse 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Hello, enemies that defend your profanity. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. Destruction and misery. I came here to edify you, but it's going to lead to your destruction because you're rejecting the truth that I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, you ought to give up the uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. You ought to give up this fast food. So, I'll not give it up. I'm just going to keep eating it. Uh, well, I can prove to you scientifically that this stuff is very toxic. It's grown with chemicals and things like that. My sister used to work for a company that sold chickens to Kentucky Fried Chicken, and they lost their farm because she ethically would not put the poison into the chicken feed. I can prove that. They're poisoning the feed, and you're eating it at Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's bad for you. It's going to give you cancer. I'm trying to edify you. Just destroy yourself. Verse 17, And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Lost people, they don't know peace. That's why they have to continually stalk this ministry. They just have to continually just try to destroy what I do and whatever else. They have no peace. And there's no fear of God before their eyes. That's why they fear a changed life. You kidding me? If you fear God and you say, God, I am wicked, I am corrupt, please help me. Just change my life, Lord. Tell me what to do. That's fearing God. Okay? Having an understanding that sin is negative and, and you need God's help. Okay? You have no fear of God? Hey, little Hollywood movies don't hurt. I can use some profanity now and then. Hey, I can get drunk occasionally and I can go out and fornicate and I can do this and I can do that. And, lie about a, a really, truly saved preacher. You know, all my enemies out there. And what they don't even realize is, by rejecting the truth that I say, they're actually destroying themselves. I've seen this thing. I've seen uh, Martin Richling, this wicked devil, uh, got cancer years ago. Oh, because he spoke against the man of God. He spoke against Denlinger and, and Brian Denlinger's superpowers, you know, and all this stuff. No, 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 no. The guy was saying that Jesus Christ was created. He was saying that salvation does not include Romans chapter 10, the hyper-dispensational heretic that he was. The guy was just a, a total nut, total liar. And so many other things he was saying too, by the way. He believed he was infallible when he spoke and everything else. The guy's a total devil. And now he's just a shriveled up little, you know, cancer patient. He's going to be dead soon and in hell. Um, and I've seen other enemies of mine that uh, pine away, as the Bible talks about die. They get sick and they die. Why? Um, because they're rejecting the truth. I mean to edify people and instead their rejection of the truth leads to their destruction. And they all go through it. Destruction and misery are in their ways. Um, I'm shocked at how much the Lord has blessed me since being in ministry. I've had so many times where I just think, well, okay, I guess the blessings are over. It's not going so good or whatever else. And all of a sudden, it's just truckloaded of blessings. I get letters from people and they say, you know, I just found your ministry and watching your videos and the Lord just changed my life so much and thank you so much. And Good times. <laughs> you know, I, the, the fruit that this ministry has borne puzzles me. You know, it really does. I mean, it just, the Lord just continues to bless this ministry. And our lives, I mean, we just, just like, 
every day we just enjoy our lives. We have so much peace, it's just crazy, <laughs> you know? And, and I want to edify people. Um, yeah, if you haven't figured it out by now, uh, my wife, myself, and my son, uh, we do a lot of experimentation on ourselves. We'll try eating the right kind of foods or we'll try living certain ways or, you know, any kind of thing. I mean, we, we try all kinds of stuff. You know why? Because we want to edify people. We want to help people. I struggled for years with headaches. What do we do? Well, we try all kinds of natural health stuff. Well, that didn't work. And this one definitely did not work. And that one was too expensive. And this one here is not, you know, whatever. Hey, this works. Hey, getting this stuff out of your life will get rid of the headaches. Getting this stuff out of your life will help you get over sickness much better, boost your immune system and whatever else. And you know what I do? We bring it out. We might make videos about it. And some things I have to come back and say, yeah, you know, we were thinking that this worked, you know, the intermittent, uh, not intermittent uh, sleep or whatever. You wake up in the middle of the night and whatever. I came out later and said, that didn't work. You know, came up with a better one and whatever else the Lord showed us and we tried out. It's all about edification. I mean, if you really understand the spirit, you know, in which I preach, even in my sarcasm, I'm still trying to edify people. I'm still trying to say, hey, turn away from that wicked stuff that it's going to destroy you. Don't listen to these false preachers and teachers and things like that. Here, go this way. It's the path of edification. It's the path to make your life better. Your walk with Jesus Christ get better. That's my heart's desire. But the wicked out there, they don't know peace. Destruction and misery are in their ways. Turn to Romans chapter 9. I'll show you another set of scriptures here. Romans chapter 9, verse 22. <clears throat> what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory? Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Okay. So again, you see it there, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. There are certain people out there, and it's not Calvinism preordained that they have no control over their life. These people of their own free will are choosing to do things wickedly. They're choosing not to turn from sin. Okay, And, and when I say turn from sin, of course, people say, oh, you got to do that for salvation. People profess to be saved, and then there's no turning from sin. Okay. Uh, you can't turn from sin before you get saved. I understand that and, and continue in that lifestyle. Okay, There are a lot of lost Catholics out there that live very good, clean lives. They do turn from sin, but the point is they're doing it to save themselves. Right? Again, if people play all these little word games and whatever else. Look, you come to the Lord as a sinner. He saves you and your life changes. It's just that simple. Right? But you get these people and they profess to be saved, and yet they continue. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And what happens? Well, they're vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. They don't want to be edified. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Again, you'd be very familiar with this one if you know the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, a good example of somebody who's actually saved, and yet destruction comes into their life because they don't receive the instruction, the edification about fleeing from fornication. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. In other words, he's either you know, fornicating with his birth mother or with his stepmother. The text doesn't really say, but either way, it's very wicked. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. False converts will run to this passage uh, those that really study the Bible and really try to pretend and, that they're Christians and convince people that they're saved, they'll run here and they'll say, see, this guy was saved and therefore, you know, we can do all kinds of other things. We can be carnal Christians 
And, um, you know, those people that say that you have to turn from sin, there's a changed life and whatever else, they're not saved. They're work salvationists. But we believe that we are saved because you can just go on and do whatever you want to do. Um, they seem to miss the point that if you are living in this kind of sin and doing these kind of wicked things, that you get turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Kind of miss that one. It's okay for them to watch their movies and, and you know, listen to the wrong kind of music and whatever else, worldly music and and have no convictions over any kind of truth type of thing. Um, they can do that and live their life. There's no chastening of the Lord there in their life, but that's okay because they're just carnal. <laughs> um, but yet the text here is talking about a guy that was doing a very wicked sin. And Paul said, hey, deliver the guy to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Kick him out of your fellowship and let God, you know, turn him over to Satan. Satan just go kill the guy. Don't really see that much with these uh, professing Christians. I pray God kills that guy over there that's wicked and doing those things. That's what Paul's saying in this text. That guy there, he's born again. He's a, he's a Christian, saved, the whole thing. He's doing this wicked thing. Okay, God, I pray that you just give that guy over to Satan. Let Satan kill him. Is that how these false converts handle uh, carnal Christians? Of course not. They, uh, they don't care about edification. They, uh, and they don't want the d destruction that comes with living in sin. You see. Because they're false. They've never been born again in the first place. Philippians chapter 3. Turn next to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 through 21. Brethren, brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. How can you be an enemy of the cross of Christ? Because you can stand there at the cross of Christ, and you can imagine, you know, you can't go back in time. I get it. But what I'm saying is, you can think about the cross of Christ, and He's dying for your sins, and you just go, ah. Oh, I don't see my sin as a big deal. I can just continue doing this stuff and live wickedly and whatever else. You're an enemy of the cross of Christ. You should look at Jesus dying on that cross in your mind and say, He died, He suffered, He bled. How can I continue doing these things that He had to die for? It's terrible. How could you do a thing like that? How could you justify it? You're an enemy of the cross of Christ these false converts out there who reject the edification that I bring and others, uh, other Bible-believing, saved, born-again Christians try to bring into your life, tell you to turn from these sins and turn from this wickedness. You reject that stuff. You're an enemy of the cross of Christ. But look at what happens. Verse 19, whose end is what? Destruction. Whose God is their belly, I like a little bit of fast food once in a while. I like a little bit of this. and Amen. I like a smorgasbord. I like to eat my junk food. I like to... But God's their belly. Hey, um, uh, actually, friend, I can show you that that stuff has toxic chemicals in it. It's hurting you. It's going to give you diabetes. It's going to give you cancer. It's going to get... Ah, whatever. Legalistic. Ha, ha, ha. I'll eat it. Ain't got to die of something. And whose glory is in their shame. False converts. Their glory is in their shame. They love to talk about the worldly things that Bible believers like myself reject and preach against. They glory in that stuff. Who mind earthly things. That's why they detest this truth right here. They don't want to think about being a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old man dying. Oh, no. Oh, no, we can't have that. i got to be able to go down to the diner and see all the guys in the area or go down to the bar or go out to my job or go to here or to go to there, and I don't want to have to suffer as a Christian. I'll just kind of blend in, you see. You mind earthly things. You can pretend that you're a Christian, you know, and they see there and just pretend that and whatever. 
And as long as a little pocket preacher there, your little pocket preacher preaches the right things, you'll continue to support him and continue to go to his church building or whatever else. But if he gets a little bit too out of line, well, then you have to just, you know, pull your giving back or go to some other place or I'm just going to now unsubscribe or whatever. <laughs> Verse 20, for our conversation, notice the contrast there. He's not saying, well, there's carnal Christians now and, and they, they do struggle with saying things, so don't judge them. No, he's saying, here's the false converts. Here's the false people right here. And here's us. Our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Bye-bye, post-tribbers. Post-trib pre-wrath. Whatever, mid-trib, post-trib before the Antichrist comes and shines a flashlight on the... You, know, <laughs> you see? I'm just making that last one up there. I mean, maybe I am. I don't know. There's so many heresies now I can't keep up with them all, you know. Uh, there might be the, the, the... We're here to see the Antichrist till he shines a flashlight. I, I don't know. <laughs> but you see, a Bible-believing Christian is looking for Jesus Christ. The next supernatural thing I'm going to see is my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Face-to-face -face with Christ my Savior. You see, that's how you know you're looking at a Christian. You look at a lost person when they're saying, well, I wish Jesus was coming. I wish it was true, but um, we're going to get to see the Antichrist. We're going to see it. Yeah, we're going to see the New World Order. We're going to go to FEMA camps. We're going to go to this. We're <laughs> they're not looking for Jesus Christ. Their conversation isn't in heaven. Verse 21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Do you look forward to having your vile body changed? Again, another thing post posties say that it just cracks me up. They'll say, you know, we don't know what it's like to suffer as Christians. We're going to have a suffering in the future. You think that you're going to get out before any suffering happens? And I'm going... <laughs> Uh, you ought to get saved and you might, you know, see what suffering's about. See what suffering's about when people cast out your name as evil and your grandparents don't want to talk to you and your, if your grandparents, your grandchildren aren't even allowed to be around you anymore and, and friends and family turning against you and you're going through all these other hardships and whatever else. You go into the grocery store and just vexation with the stinking rock music all the time. You're going, oh, oh, and, then, and then your body's trying to sing along with it and go along with the thing and, and you're, you're smelling cigarette smoke and you go, boy, that reminds me of, oh, no, don't do that. And, and just constantly, oh, you go through the grocery store, you see the junk food, you're going, oh, that, no, oh, no, it's bad. And just, oh, uh, who shall change our vile body? You looking forward to that? What do you do as a Christian? Well, um, brethren, there's some good ways that you can fight these certain sins. And, and um, if, you, if you try to get into this thing here and you, you try to edify people, but they don't want edification. They want destruction. Why? Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace have they, 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 have they not known. Second Peter chapter 3. So I don't understand. You said there that, that God will use you for this stuff. Yeah, He will. You see, there are certain people out there that God's going to judge. And He'll use you to do it. And He'll use me to do it. Hey, um, Ryan, are you willing to be a punching bag for the lost world? Let them say all kinds of evil things about you and make fun of your wife, make fun of your son, make fun of... How you earn a living, how you dress, how you look, how you drive, what you drive, where you live, um, how you preach, uh, when you mess up, you, are you willing to do that? Yes. Hey, Christian, are you willing to have people cast out your name as evil, kick you around, stomp you around, have your family turn against you, have your friends turn against you, lose your job? Are you willing to do that for Jesus? You say, well, but brother, I have some really positive things to say. I'd really like to edify people. Uh, yeah, but you're going to learn if you're newly saved that uh, most people don't want it. They want destruction. Verse 
2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 through 18. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. Oh, Paul and Peter, they were, they were diametrically opposed. They hated each other. Peter rejected Paul. You know, I did a whole video on that thing, the false apostle Paul movement. <laughs> Another one of the wingnut movements out there, crazy people believe that stuff. But Peter is saying the same thing as Paul here. We look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. You know what the best thing about heaven is going to be? There's no sin there. No more rock music in the grocery stores. No more filthy images. No more profanity. I can't wait for that. Righteousness. Is it right? So, well, is it right? Can I edify you with this righteousness? I'd like to present it to you. Can I tell you about this King James Bible and why it's God's perfect word? Can I tell you about the right way to eat? Can I tell you about the right way to the kind of music you should listen to? Listen to hymns for an hour and listen to rock music for an hour. See the difference in the way you feel. Oh, come on. Now I like a little bit of classic rock once in a while. Destruction. And half the time you listen to the rock music and stuff like that, they're, they're talking about, you know, killing themselves and whatever else, you know. <laughs> I, I know, I used to listen to the secular rock stuff, you know, whatever. They don't like righteousness. Verse 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Hmm. You're going to heaven, you know? Uh, don't you want to be kind of, you know, preparing your life there before you get there? You know, kind of building up to what it's going to really be like there. Can't wait for the righteousness that's going to be there. Nah, I'm just going to live it up down here and, and uh, get my fill of sin before I get to heaven. Because then it's just going to be dull and I'm going to be sitting around strumming a harp or something. That's the way lost people think. Verse 15, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you. Uh, that's a real good verse to show anybody that says that Paul was a false apostle and that the others rejected him and things. Uh, Peter calls him our beloved brother Paul. You just read plain English, you know. Verse 16, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of, of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, you see, their call actually means believe. Huh? Uh, no, it doesn't. Oh, yes, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Call means believe. Um, no, I can prove it doesn't. Oh, well, how's that? Um, because call is spelled C-A-L-L -L and believe is B-E-L-I-E-V-E. -E -E. It's not the same word. Oh, yes, but it means the same thing. What are they doing? They're resting. They're twisting. Paul's writing there and he's saying, you know, Romans chapter 10, you get the Romans road going through. It's such a salvation. It's easy. It's You just look at it. There it is. You know, go to Romans chapter 3, verse 10. You got to go up through and whatever. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And, you know, I'm... Skipping a lot of them there, but Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Simple, easy. There you go. Get saved. You know? Well, I think that we need to look at this thing in a different way. And they start twisting it and resting it. What are they doing? Under their own destruction. Well, you see, I can have salvation here and I can just kind of mess around with the sin and stuff that's negatively affecting me. I can just kind of do that, I'll just be a carnal Christian and just kind of enjoy the world until I get there to heaven and then I'll just have to give it up then. I, you know, It's just kind of going to be a bit of a bummer you know, when I die and I go to heaven and there's not going to be any rock music or anything up there, but I'll, I'll enjoy it while I'm here. Huh? 
And any Christian that I see that, that is living righteously and has a separated godly life, I'll just simply say, oh, they're a work salvationist, lordship salvation. I'll just start screaming that. You know what they're doing? They're resting the scriptures. They're just twisting things and saying, well, that doesn't actually mean this and this doesn't actually mean that. And they're just twisting and twisting and twisting. I mean, the Bible is not written that hard, okay, when it comes to salvation. You know, there are certain doctrinal things that, yeah, lost people can't get. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them nor spiritually discern. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I think it is. Um, okay, there are certain things in the Scriptures that are hard to understand. But that's the doctrinal stuff for Christians. That's why the Lord did it that way, so we can be separate from the lost world. Saved, born-again Christians are in agreement on most things. There are certain areas of liberty that we have, certainly. But uh, you get lost people, they come along and they say, well, I know what you're saying about salvation, but let me just kind of tweak it a little bit here. They're resting the Scriptures. You see, they want to be able to say, I'm a Christian, and yet I have all these sins in my life. I'm a Christian, but I can accept this other over here and that over there and this whatever, and I'll just call myself carnal. They're resting the Scriptures unto their own destruction. And they'll look at you and see your attempt to edify people, and they'll reject it unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Be very careful who you listen to. There's a lot of false prophets on YouTube. Okay? A whole lot of them. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. Yeah. And by the way, growing in grace does not mean that you're just going to put up with people and whatever else. It's that you, when you grow in grace, you're learning more. The Lord's showing you more in your life. More, He's giving you more power to edify people. Um, I wouldn't have been worth following back when I first got saved. I believed a lot of really dumb things and did a lot of really dumb things. But as I get older and I grow in grace, um, again, people, you know, they don't, they don't get it. They most people just don't get it. They think that when I condemn things that I'm, I don't have grace for people and whatever else. Um, I just got to tell this story. You know, a while back I came out with some stuff about superfoods and whatever. And I actually had a little bit of a little carnal moment, moment there. And I thought, you know, by giving out this information on my channel, and I know all these satanic goons watch me, I'm actually giving these people the ability to make themselves healthier, thereby being able to better attack me and they're going to live longer. And I thought, I don't know if I should do that. <laughs> and it was just like the Lord said, no, 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 you know, bring out the information. You need to get it out there, you know, and, and uh, they're going to reject it anyways, you know, and they do. But, um, you know, I grow in grace because God uses me more and I want to edify people more. Um, you know, there. I want to bring out more stuff in the future. How to edify people, how to help people, um, and uh, some of it's going to be secular information in terms of you know I'm not going to be just tying everything in with the scriptures. Some of it's just going to be some of the off grid stuff that the Lord's been showing us. Uh, ways that you can save money, ways that you can go off grid, and easier ways to live and whatever else, get out of debt, things like that. Uh, why? Because I want to edify people. Uh, it's not salvation issues stuff, you know, it's, it's just, well, sal eternal salvation. It is, you know, save yourself from a whole lot of headaches and whatever else. Um, but that's what I desire. As I grow in grace, I desire to edify people more. And some people think it's the opposite. Well, Denlinger's judging all this stuff. He's so judgmental. He's so narrow-minded. He's this, he's that. Because he has no grace. Uh just can't help certain people. Just as simple as that. So, that is going to be it for this study. Um, you'll see that in your life as a Christian. That there are some times the Lord puts you in a situation and that person has no desire for repentance. That person has no desire to change their ways. And um, brethren, sometimes it's just because God wants to judge them. 
we were talking about this on the drive up here today, and I said to my wife, you know, um, police officers, a just police officer, can't pull somebody over based on pre-crime. Uh, that car looks like it's going to be speeding, so I'm just going to go ahead and give them a ticket a while. Well, that doesn't work. You have to wait until they do some kind of a crime, and then you can pull them over and arrest them. Uh, they have a free will, in other words, to obey the speed limit or to disobey it. And that police officer just has to be there to just stand back and let them have their free will. Well, we are the same thing as Christians. Um, there's a lot of similarities between us and a police officer. Um, did a study on that many years ago, but um, we have to just get the truth out there. Edify people. And then it's up to them. They have a free will to accept or reject that. And if they reject it, okay, now you can judge them. Now you can say, you know, uh, you're rejecting some serious truth here. I think you need to examine yourself, whether you're, you're even in the faith. I think you've believed in vain. You know, oh, you're this, you're that, you're preaching a false gospel. Okay, destroy yourself. I know destruction and misery are in your ways. Um, just the way it is. Um, you know, I, I again, I can look at my life and I can see that, um, you know, this, there's a cult building right across, right there. I'm looking at it right through the window here in uh, the town of Bridgewater. Full gospel assembly. They are fools. And they tried to have this rock concert years ago. And I uh, went over and I told off the pastor and stuff and said, you're wicked and whatever, rebuked him with scripture and, and, um, they called the police on me, whatever, explained it to the police officer, and, and he said, well, they have a permit to do this. And he said, why don't you go down to the town hall and protest this thing? I said, yes, sir, I'll do that. Went down, did what the police officer told me to do, and she said we, they didn't have a permit. So that these charismatic nuts over here actually lied to a state trooper. That's good, good Christian uh, testimony there. But uh, they're about ready to shut down. Barely anybody even goes to the thing. They're using the thing for flea markets now. You know, have people come in there. Why? Well, because they spoke against God's man, God's preacher. <clears throat> you know, they're not Denley rights. <clears throat> so they, you know, they don't wear flannel or have beards, so they're, they're not good, right with God. <laughs> no, uh, they rejected the truth. The people in this town didn't need a rock concert. They need the gospel. You're not going to convert people, true conversion, with rock concerts. So why did God bring us here to this town? Well, I believe ultimately to judge them and a lot of other people. Why did the Lord give us the land that we originally had when we moved here to Maine? To judge our wicked neighbor. Prayed and prayed and prayed to get the guy saved and whatever. Finally had a chance to preach the gospel to him and he flat out rejected it. Was dead within a few months. Died in his own vomit. Face forward. The drunk. Um, talked about the casino thing recently. I think the, the wicked people that are behind it, I think the Lord's uh, brought us to that area to judge them and judge some other things down in that area. And I've seen that thing time and time again. I mean, we've gone into stores and just innocently tracked the thing, you know, put a track down or whatever else, or, you know, and months later the store shut down. And we've seen it time and time and time again. It's no longer just, well, I don't know, maybe it's a coincidence. There are no coincidences in, in the life of a Christian. But, uh, I've seen that thing. And uh, for the people out there that, that hate my guts and want to speak against me and things, attack my beard. Attack what I wear, how I speak, whatever else. But don't you attack the truth that I preach from this book. Because if you do, destruction is coming to you. Not by me, by the Lord. You better be, better be real careful what you say against the truth, what you speak against the truth. And quite frankly, I'm just going to say this too. Um, I'm glad to hear of the destruction. Because you see, I believe in justice and judgment. I don't believe in worshiping a God that is just okay with other people's sins and doesn't really want to make any kind of harsh judgments. Or Judge them. Judge them. If I come with edification and try to help somebody and they slap it out of, out of my hand and, and spit in my face and, and threaten me, and what? okay, judge them. I pray for God's judgment to hit the enemies of this ministry that have no desire for repentance, no desire to do anything but just tear me down. I pray that God judges you. This is as simple as that. Because I know that you're trying to damn other people to hell. 
destruction and misery are in your ways. You have no fear of God. That's why you want to continue in your sin, you see. So I pray that the wrath of God hits you out there. If you have no desire to repent and get right with God, then I pray God stops your lying tongue. So that is going to be it. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do pray, Lord, for the Bible-believing world out there. There's not many of us, but I pray, Lord, for them. I pray that um, you would help them to stand firm and not be ashamed of your word, um, but to be a partaker of the attacks and things that come upon Bible-believing Christians. I pray, Lord, that we would not be weary in well-doing, but that we would seek to continue to edify people, to help anybody that would listen. And if those people reject it, then destruction is coming upon them. And um, I just really do pray, Lord, that you would encourage the brethren out there uh, to stand firm. Uh, I don't know how much time is left, Lord, but it, it feels more and more like there's just not much time to go. And uh, we all need to stand fast and uh, not be led away with the error of the wicked. And I ask... All of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So that's going to be it. And again, you know, just got to say this. Another great proof for the uh, pre-trib rapture, if you want to call it that, the catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble. I know we talk about that a lot. But another great proof is, you know, we're here to edify people. Um, but the time comes when the body of Christ leaves. The edification is over. Okay. Destruction is coming at that point in time. All right, just another little interesting thing to think about there. Um, I mean, how do you have this, the, the, the break there? God has His church here to edify the lost world there and, and to try to get people to, to you know, uh, hey, there's going to be a strip club put in down there. No, we're going to protest that. Uh, there's going to be a casino put in down there. No, no, we're going to stop that. We're there as a light to shine in this dark world. But when we go, then God's destruction comes. But uh, if you believe in the post-trib thing or whatever else, well, then it's just kind of all mushes together and just kind of fades in there and whatever else. Uh, yeah, we're here to edify, but, you know, God's destruction is going to kind of hit everybody. And Sorry about that, you know. I mean, God's always spared the righteous, you know, but uh, except for this time when it's the righteous are actually members of his body. You know, you figure that one out. Uh, nobody in the Old Testament was in Christ. We're in Christ today, but God's judgment's going to hit us as well as the wicked. Uh, no, it isn't. So that is going to be it. Um, it's winter time here. Uh, we've been getting some snow. It's been really cold. We're still trying to work out some details at our property and things, but um, just please do keep us in your prayers. Thank you to everybody out there that supports the ministry that keeps us going. Uh, We'll see you in future videos.